Welcome to Uncommons, a podcast focused on Canadian politics. I'm your host, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith. On this episode, I'm joined by Elizabeth May. She was the Green Party leader from 2006 until late last year in 2019. She's been elected since 2011. And in the last parliament, we were closely together to call for stronger climate action and to strengthen animal protection laws. So thank you, Elizabeth, for joining me on, you know, it's a new podcast on Commons, so I appreciate you taking the time. And I, I first want to just ask you, we are all facing as MPs, dealing with constituents and addressing constituents' needs. Yeah. You seem to be in a, a bit more of a unique position in the context of this pandemic as a leader, a parliamentary leader of, of the Green Party. Are, are you finding yourself very much focused on your riding, or are you focused cross-country? A bit of both. I have to say the, the constituent issues, particularly stranded constituents around the world, the first part of this pandemic, and I actually found myself the other day, I do a weekly newsletter, and in writing my weekly newsletter, I thought, I've, I, I've got to get a hold of a time frame here. I'm, I'm losing track of when did this all start, you know, and I sort of went back and thought, okay, I'm going to fairly arbitrarily decide March 9th becomes when I enter pandemic world, because that was the Monday, the day of the first death in Canada. By that Friday, March 13th, we adjourned Parliament. And I, you know, in coming home to my riding and knowing I had to self-isolate for a while, because I felt I'd been exposed to lots of people in Parliament and in airports, and I live in a small community with a lot of seniors. I wasn't, I didn't want to be a vector of disease. So I was, I self-isolated the first 14 days home. And my notion of what that was going to be like wasn't what it was like. I had no idea of the workload of constituent issues that would immediately hit me. So st a stranded school group in Guatemala, uh, stranded people in, in Ecuador, Peru, um, New Zealand. I still have people in India, but I've Yeah, gotten, Spain, India, I mean, around yeah, the world. Everywhere around the world. We're all in, so that, that workload became, because it felt, because it was urgent, personal, and easily could be a matter of life and death, was, has been all consuming. And then I'd say about three or three days ago, the workload kind of shifted to more people on the ground here in my riding, small business owners, individuals, people who can't meet their bills, whether for their business or for them personally, has become overwhelming. And the, the lines of communication with the government have never been as open. And they're seven days a week, which is also weird. So as an MP, you know this. I mean, we've, we've got a daily, including Saturday and Sunday, conference call to get answers for all parliamentarians from various departments. So, so that constituent-related workload is huge, but also I've taken on cases for people who don't live in my community, but somehow knew someone who did, or, or through the other Green MPs. We had one case that was just so hard of a refugee family from Iran where the, the mom and toddler and the mom's pregnant had gone to visit relatives in Iran. So I mean, Tehran, we have no embassy on the ground. I can't say enough about the work of Francois-Philippe Champagne, his team, your colleague, Rob Oliphant, who's parliamentary uh, secretary. Been excellent. These guys are heroes. They've been working really 24 seven with, I don't know what happened to the normal work of Global Affairs Canada, but it looks to me like um, dozens, if not hundreds of people have become essentially travel agents focusing on, you know, I had constituents on cruise ships. I'm sure you did too. Yeah. So all of that workload, a lot of it is constituent based, but a lot of it, you're right. A lot of my focus is also national. What are the right policies and programs? How do we, what do we put in place as legislation? What are the right tools? And of course, not losing sight of the climate crisis. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to say that probably three quarters of my work has been very, very focused on individual people or individual businesses. And the larger public policy ideas that spring from that are then taken to the national level. And do you find, obviously there are some gaps early on in the CERB eligibility and sole proprietors who are excluded from the interest-free loan because they don't have uh, the right payroll and, and meet that threshold. Do you though find overall, I, I've seen you speak quite supportively of, of the government policies rolled out to date. Do you find overall that those there's engagement as you say, but that the government is on the right track? You know, if, if the current set of policies had been introduced and then Bill Morneau and the prime minister said, yeah, we think we got it covered. That's all you're gonna see. I would be, um, not supportive, I'd be very angry. 
but what I hear and what I experience on direct, you know, I'm, I'm on direct phone conversations with Bill Morneau because they have put in place bi-weekly calls with all the finance critics and they've let me in those meetings, which is so helpful. We've had one so far, but I don't hear Bill Morneau saying that's all there is, you know, we can't afford more. I'm hearing, yeah, we got the fiscal firepower. We realize there's people who've been left out. We've got to do more for indigenous communities. We've got to do more for seniors. We've got to do more for people who, you know, don't fit the CERB benefit for any kind of bunch of reasons. And the prime minister outlined them the other day in his press conference. So I feel as though we're being heard. That there are unacceptable gaps that remain. And we have, to, we have to find the tools to fill those gaps. So I remain supportive. I think this is a moment that we will historically refer to as one like a wartime. You know how I've always been calling in Parliament for us to have a war cabinet on climate, that we treat the climate emergency the way we would have treated the governance in the Second World War, that it's all hands on deck. Well, we're now living that. I used it as a metaphor, but as a, as a real public policy choice that we had to make that to address the climate crisis, we had to stop being partisan. We had to make it all hands on deck. We're living that now. And I'm very supportive of it. I mean, heck, we were even seeing Doug Ford and Christian Freeland have become new best friends. Right. And I, I never thought I'd hear myself say out loud, gosh, I, I love Doug Ford. So, you know, it, it's a new world. <laughs> it's, a new world. It's, a, it's interesting you put it that way too, because on the one hand, it, it speaks to the ability for governments across different levels of government to, to mobilize together against a common threat and a common challenge. And I think if we can do it for COVID-19 and, and this terrible pandemic, surely we can do it for climate change. And then I read the executive director of the International Energy Agency say, we should not allow today's crisis to compromise our efforts to tackle climate change. And right. I think he, he has to be right. And so you had indicated some of your attention is still obviously focused on addressing the climate crisis and some of these big picture policies that have to come out of here, uh, out, out of this crisis, I suppose. And, and do you have a sense of where, what that advocacy is at the moment? Yeah, I just want to, just what, just when you were asking that, I thought it would be funny to share with you. I mean, trying to rescue constituents, my global work on climate change means that when I had people stranded in Peru, I contacted, I didn't have any way to reach him. I tried to do a direct message on Twitter to Manuel Pulgar Vidal, who's the former Minister of Environment from Peru, who was the president of COP20, right, in Lima. And he put me in touch with other ministers in the government now to have, and I'm sending that information into your, to the Global Affairs Canada. Look, I've got direct phone numbers to, in getting constituents out of New Zealand, I'm reaching out to the Minister of Climate in New Zealand, James Shaw, who's one of my favorite friends because he's the co-leader of the New Zealand Greens. So the networks I have had globally around climate work, I actually have no shame in saying, can you help me? I've got a constituent. She's stuck. And, you know, so, um, but back to the climate issue and paying attention to it during COVID-19. In those conversations, I'm also talking to those other global environment ministers from around the world and others and saying, okay, what are we going to do uh, to make sure that as we come out of pandemic, we're focused on climate? Because 2020 is a crunch year under the Paris Agreement. It's when Canada has to have put in place a new target. And some countries, obviously the United States, you know, Trump is weakening environmental rules because of COVID-19. Um, we're not seeing that happen elsewhere. And we're not seeing that happen in Canada, that despite a lot of pressure, uh, and I think illogical pressure to reduce the carbon tax, when the price of a barrel of oil has dropped to, you know, it, it, you know it's just, you know, $25 a barrel, it, the, the price of gas at the tank means that your carbon tax impact is minuscule. Right. So to say now's the time to withdraw the carbon tax is so illogical, and it shows a willingness from some to keep partisanship at the fore. So I'm really pleased that your buddies in the liberal minority government there are standing firm and saying, no, we're not reducing the carbon price. But they're not yet saying, and guess what? We have to double the target because 2020 is a crunch year. Now in the, in the COVID-19 swirl of news, I mean, it's gotten a lot more attention that various sports seasons are not gonna happen this year. 
this is the first year since 1995 that there will not be a climate negotiation through a conference of the parties. It was supposed to start November 9th in Glasgow. It's COP26, and as I said, 2020 is a crunch year. So this is a crunch negotiation. And there's already a lot of speculation happening. Will this be good or bad? I mean, if Trump isn't reelected, avoiding a cop that's critical when he's still in the White House, because even if he, the, the cop would begin after the US election, had it happened, right. right, November 9th, but the cycle of US politics means that the president of the United States, the new one elected in November, if there is a new one elected in November, doesn't get inaugurated till January. Oh, so maybe a delay helps us. But a delay can be catastrophic if in the period of time when COP should be happening in Glasgow, you know, of course, hosted by Boris Johnson, who's now in intensive care. I mean, the world is changing very, very fast. But in terms of climate negotiations and climate politics, the pressure to have comprehensive improvements in the targets and plans of every country don't go away because we're, we, the window on 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is uh, not a safe climate, but a survivable climate. It, it's a livable climate. We have to hold to that. If we, if we lose holding on to 1.5 degrees, if that window closes, it closes forever. And the public health impacts of that will make COVID-19 look like a relatively fun time on earth because it will be that much worse for public health, for survival of humanity. And it does speak to the importance of relying upon expert advice, too. So in the course of this pandemic, you mentioned Doug Ford and, and really people from all parties in Canada, at least, coming together, respecting the science, elevating public health voices, putting partisan differences aside and saying, let's get, let's get this done together. We're all in this together. Do you... Should we be optimistic about the ability to do the same on climate on the way outside of this pandemic? I think we have to be optimistic. I mean, I think any choice other than being optimistic, uh, you know, <laughs> to succumb to despair doesn't ever help, right? Yeah, you are, you're a good optimist, Nate. I think you, you're, you're, you're one of the cheerleaders for we can get through this, and I appreciate that. We have to be positive. Here's some of the more the deeper reasons that I think COVID-19 and the pandemic, I mean, I sure don't want to suggest that it's in any way other than a very, very, very horrific period of time. And that one, one finds silver linings, one's not saying a silver lining overwhelms the cloud, right? So you always be very sensitive to the idea. I put on Twitter at one point that, that there were some silver linings and immediately got blasted by the predictable troll faction that I was some kind of sicko because I thought COVID-19 was a good thing while people are dying. Obviously, no, I don't. No, but lessons learned. I mean, yeah. If we are to get out of this successfully, it is because we have all worked together and we have mobilized together. And surely there are, are lessons learned for common global challenges going forward. Yeah, exactly. And here's some of the bigger kind of, they may be paradigm shifts in our awareness. I'm a completely different generation from you, obviously, but I'm the last generation. That I don't know, not so obviously. I'm, I'm, uh, no, I'm, no, I'm, no. I'm, I'm losing enough time. <laughs> Listen, I'm the last generation, being a boomer, born in 1954, I'm a generation that has a direct personal experience through the oral history of my parents and it felt close, right? The depression, the second world war felt close. I have stories, you know, I remember my, you know, my mom's stories of friends of her father who, you know, jumped out of windows because they couldn't figure out how they were gonna feed their families in the depression. I have, I have a sense, my, my dad grew up in London and people all around him were killed in the blitz. And so those, my dad once encapsulated this difference really well. We were, we were living in Cape Breton, which was our family home once uh, from when I was a, uh, an older teenager. And we were fighting the government as ever on an environmental issue, trying to stop offshore oil and gas wells, actually inshore, quite close to the coast of Cape Breton Island. And it was a, it felt like nonstop struggle, but we've been like in nonstop stop struggle against our government seemed like forever. You know, my family was in a court case against spraying Agent Orange and we lost our land in that. So, we, but during the oil and gas fight uh, in the, trying to protect the Gulf of St. Lawrence, my father who'd been through the blitz said to me, you know, I think I really preferred the second world war. I said, oh, 
you know, it blew my mind. I said, well, wow. you know, da daddy, how could you, how could you say that? I mean, how, how could you possibly say, well, you know, back then we really had the feeling the government was on our side. Now that to me was a light bulb when I thought, right, I'm the last generation that has an immediate sense of a time when government was on our side. Thanks to neoliberalism, ever since the end of the, 19, the late 1980s, the mantra has been, government has its hand in your pocket. Government is alien to you. The private sector, you know, let's just celebrate private enterprise, entrepreneurial, you know, all this, this, this package of views that's neoliberalism hasn't had, it hasn't run up against the real wall that in a crisis, you're not cheering your billionaires, you're cheering your frontline public health workers, your, your firefighters, you're cheering- Your minimum wage drivers. grocery store worker. I mean, there are so yeah. many essential workers who make next to nothing. And so many of us who are not essential whatsoever that, that make far too much. It, it yeah. puts so us on its head So here we are, sure. and I think it could be a breaking point with the mantra of neoliberalism. I think it could be a moment where uh, the public sphere is embraced again, that Canadians at all ages now can say, yeah, the way my dad did. We have the feeling the government is on our side. Now that is important because when big carbon mobilizes, and they will, to say, we need an economic stimulus package for recovery, even though it's clear that the fossil fuel industry is going down the drain, the price of a barrel of oil isn't gonna suddenly bounce back. Uh, the demand for oil isn't gonna suddenly bounce back. And if it did, we're up against climate science that says, we have to reduce our emissions by approximately half of what they were globally in 2005 and do it by 2030. So we can't risk that in the post-pandemic period, the, the economic drivers are around, you know, we reduced pollution a lot during this pandemic, let's boost it up again. We have to say, let's hang on to those reductions we got and make them deeper by investing in 100% renewable energy, investing in energy efficiency, investing in a grid structure for electric vehicles, all those things that you and I, and you know, a just transition strategy for workers, the things we know we have to do can now be buttressed, I hope, by a changed attitude to wh what can we expect of government? It's interesting you say, what can we expect of government? Because I think it's also what can we expect of one another? Because if anything, I have seen an emphasis on this notion of solidarity. And, and when I think of being in high school and the strikes and my parents were both teachers and I always thought of solidarity through the lens of my union parents. And yet in this pandemic, there is a sense of we are all affected together. We are all challenged by the same health crisis. And not only is government acting for us, but we are all expecting each other to, to be there for one another as well. And so I think taking that same sense of solidarity together forward on global challenges like climate change is critically important too, that we, we, we all yeah, have absolutely. to do our part. I mean, I think that, I mean, and Christian Freeland has been saying it. I mean, during the election, I was saying all hands on deck. Green Party platform was all about all hands on deck climate emergency, mission impossible, we can do this together. It was hard to say that in a, into a, a, a culture that didn't know what it looked like. Now we know what it looks like to have all hands on deck. I mean, the fact, I mean, sharing with anybody who's watching this with us, Nate, that the civil service function, you know, people working in the Ottawa civil service are on the phone with MPs on Saturdays and Sundays. There's no let up to the work because yeah. we have a sense of, well, all hands on deck, we've got to do more. We know there's people suffering out there. We know we have to protect our healthcare workers. We have to get the PPE devices. We have to make sure that the students who are looking for summer jobs know there's help coming. I mean, you look group by group, seniors who are insecure. None of us are stopping the work. So we but it's impossible to dismiss when, when we say we need a wartime mobilization to tackle this pandemic, it is, it's not easy to dismiss in the same way that when you have previously talked about a wartime effort to tackle climate change, I, I don't think people took that quite as seriously. Yeah. Now, 
you, I, I mentioned coming to politics partly through, uh, you know, I saw strikes when I was in high school and motivated to get in politics, partly because I think politics is a, a noble profession and a, and a force for good and a way to make a more positive difference. You, I, I have a picture of you, strangely, by way of a constituent. So Tom McElroy is one of my most brilliant constituents. He is one of the inventors of the UV index, and he is very passionate and rightly so about climate change. Uh, he's now a retired professor from New York University, and he meets with me pretty regularly and sends me articles to read and, and gets in touch to say, you should be thinking about this on climate change. You should, should be thinking about that. And he sent me a picture. Of, he's in the back, and it's the, a picture of a number of people who have been working on the Montreal Protocol. And there you are in the front as a, a policy advisor to the then Minister yeah. of Environment. Is that right? Yeah, I was senior policy advisor to the Minister of Environment in the Mulroney years from 86 to 88. Uh, Tom McMillan recruited me from my work, which was, you know, I mentioned fighting Agent Orange pesticides. So because I was from Cape Breton Island and Tom McMillan was from Prince Edward Island, he really knew of me and he wanted to bring someone into his office who was an environmentalist first and foremost, I wasn't a member of their party. And I was amazed that, the, that a progressive conservative minister of environment would want to bring me on to ministerial staff. But I was senior policy advisor for two years. Unfortunately, I did have to quit when the minister broke the law. But <laughs> this experience of seeing government work really well when it worked really well, which it did, we got the Montreal Protocol. Mulroney had a tremendous environmental record acid rain, and also early leadership on the climate crisis. Um, but I came to it because of the work I was already doing as a grassroots activist. So getting involved in politics as someone who ran for office would never have happened. After I left Macmillan's office about a year later, I started a national office for Sierra Club of Canada. And I did that for 17 years. And every couple of years, almost every election, honestly, some party or other would try to woo me with, you know, appeals to my, they'd flatter me and they'd say, you know, you'd be a star candidate. And we'd no one ever flattered me. <laughs> and I, yeah. And I would always, I'd always end up thinking, nah, I have too many friends who are environment ministers who are at a cabinet table where no one listens. And even if I were to be in a cabinet, I don't think I'd feel that I had as much of an impact on public policy as I do staying nonpartisan and organizing with the Sierra Club. So the moment when all that changed for me was Stephen Harper and seeing someone I loved, and it's such a hard thing to talk about, to see Jack Layton decide that supporting Stephen Harper and, and Gilles Duceppe doing the same, to bring down a minority government of Paul Martin's and where Paul Martin had just delivered a really good plan to reach Kyoto, which no one remembers, even your, the, the, the current liberal, since the 2015 election, no, even I was stunned how the liberal ministers didn't really know what Paul Martin had had on the table in 2006. Well, 2005 is when they tabled the plan. But we'd just gotten the Kyoto plan. We'd just gotten a national universal daycare plan. And we had the Kelowna Accord. And to watch that government be brought down, by the way, on the opening day of the climate negotiations, November 28, 2005, was the opening day of COP11 when Stéphane Dion was Minister of Environment. And I went from being nonpartisan to realizing, oh my goodness, this crazy first past the post system is leading good people to do horrible things. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that the NDP had decided that getting rid of the liberals was important because if the liberals delivered on Kelowna, Kyoto, and, and daycare, the NDP could never beat them. Uh, that too much of the NDP base would say, well, okay, Paul Martin and his gang are good. So for purely partisan reasons, we got Stephen Harper. And at that moment, and through that election campaign was when I decided, I know Stephen Harper quite well. And I've been trying to, you know, over the years go to see him as Sierra Club's executive director. And I knew that I could not do anything about Stephen Harper from civil society that I actually had to get into big P politics. And at the same time, I had a bunch of friends who were in the Green Party saying, Jim Harris is stepping down as leader. We really need you to run for leader. I didn't know if I would win. Part of me didn't want to win because I knew I didn't like politics. So 13 years as leader of the Green Party, but it wouldn't have happened without that horrible moment of, of 2005, 2006, 
and losing a really progressive government and then getting almost 10 years of Stephen Harper. And, uh, you know, I, I hope I played some role in terms of speaking out about what was happening under Harper in finally getting a change in government. I still hope, because I don't think that, the, you know, as of today, Canada's climate target remains unchanged from what Stephen Harper left behind. It's unacceptable. It's, we are in the bottom of the barrel of industrialized countries, the bottom of the oil barrel, in terms of showing any commitment to real climate action. So, it, but that's why I went to politics. And so can I ask you though, so I, I wanna get to the, uh, the current climate targets a little bit, um, yeah. but I, I'm curious if you don't get into politics for so long because you think in this role as executive director of this uh, organization, Sierra Club, I'm able to make a bigger difference than being in the partisan back and forth. And, and if, even if I was around a cabinet table, if I wasn't listened to, what's the point? I'm able to commit, change minds in the role that I, I'm in. You now have been Green Party or you were Green Party leader for over a decade. And do you, do you think that was the right choice in terms of, yeah. and so pol politics was a vehicle then in the end for making oh, a significant yeah. difference. I mean, the, diff the difficulty was, and I watched this happen with most of the environmental groups across the country, the way in which CRA threats were used shut down the voice of a lot of environmental groups. And the environmental movement, frankly, even today, is still constrained in a way that we weren't when I was in the movement. So the, the movement was more focused on we need to tell you what needs to be done and we're not afraid if you don't want to do it, we're going to tell you the truth. Um, and I don't want to criticize the environment movement and podcast with you, but it, it, let's just say they're more constrained now. Right. Uh, I think it, we needed to be able, you know, in, it, it's essential for civil society groups to be nonpartisan, whether they're, you know, Kairos or Oxfam or Sierra Club or Suzuki Foundation uh, you know, or, or EGAL, you got to stay nonpartisan so that p people who are not <laughs> non so the, the political leadership, the partisan politicians will give you the time of day because they don't suspect, yeah, you, you guys are never going to vote for us. I know what party you belong to. So civil society groups must stay nonpartisan. But to take on someone like Stephen Harper, you had to have someone be partisan. And it was hard for me because uh, I, one of the reasons I love the Green Party and uh, one of Green's founders from Germany, the late Petra Kelly, who was also a friend of mine, Petra used to call the Green Party the anti-party party. And it's true, we really don't like partisanship. You know, we really don't like the political party uh, system and hyper-partisanship, I think, is the enemy of democracy as well as an enemy of thinking. Right. Which, despite being a little, I think I share that view and, I, and I've appreciated our ability to work together yeah. for those reasons. I mean, I think we all benefit from, we're not going to agree on everything, and yeah. you and I could even debate climate targets probably in land sli in slightly different places, but... Well, you might be more radical than me, Nate. I'm never sure. <laughs> on some things, maybe. I'm, although I was pleased to see you guys stand up in the election on decriminalization of drugs, too, and, and yeah. I think it's important, even when we don't win the fight right away, yeah. convincing change before laws get changed we, we've got to change minds and so even right. if we even if we don't win right away we we, we might win overall if, if we're vocal enough and and we put forward the evidence in the right way so okay so on, on that note we might as well talk about targets so net zero by 2050 is i pushed for in the last parliament and i was very happy to see it not only in the platform but as a as a centerpiece really of the throne speech and but for the current pandemic i have no doubt that we would be significantly moving forward to accountability legislation with a net zero target 2030 we had a very vague commitment i would say which mm -hmm. was to do better than our current target and our current target being around 512 megatons and at the same time i i understand how difficult it can be to move a big ship around and so i look at projected emissions from 20, early 2016, Environment Canada says our projected 2030 emissions were 815 megatons. Then they release a report in early 2019 and they say projected 2030 emissions, if all policies hold that we put in place, are now 592 megatons. And I see that as a huge move, although I recognize insufficient, but in my lifetime, certainly for the first time, I've seen a federal government stand up and say, this matters and, and we're going to move the needle. 
592 is still very far away from or where we need to be. Obviously, 80 megatons away from our current target, but uh, even more so, when I look at the IPCC math, it says you know 45% uh, below 2010, which, which would be for us in Canada, if you just do the straight math, would be 380 megatons. But you previously have said we should be even more ambitious. It, Right. Why? Well, that's because we have a historic legacy. We're a laggard country. Um, we're still 17% above our 1990 levels. Now, when we started all these negotiations back before the Rio Earth Summit, so negotiations for the climate treaty started in 1990, and it was agreed that 1990 would be a base year, so everybody's targets were co comparable. Um, Stephen Harper actually undermined the whole global regime by playing with the base year. But we're 17% above our 1990 levels. Uh, the UK, as an example, is close to 40% below its 1990 levels. Most of Europe is on the order of 30 to 40% below 1990. We're 17% above 1990. So in order to hit a global target, the IPCC says, it's not a political target, but there's a carbon budget and it's fixed. You can't argue with physics. I mean, it's just like talking about the COVID-19 situation. You wouldn't say well, doctors and public health experts tell us to stand two meters apart, but that's really hard to do. So we're gonna stand one meter apart and say, we're almost there. No, it, it, it doesn't wash. You have, to, you have to follow the science and the science says, these numbers are boss and we don't get to negotiate with physics. And we know that if we go above 1.5 degrees Celsius, global average temperature increase, we are at a significant risk of runaway global warming that destroys human civilization potentially leads to extinction. So these are, not, these are not small order gambles. We have to put all of our weight behind. We have to hold to 1.5, which means Canada has to do much more than we're currently on track to do. And it does mean, as we were saying earlier, listen to the, when you listen to science and government then says, okay, it's all hands on deck because this is what we've got to do. We don't have choices here. Um, that then we have to have, and I, I do think it's a very good thing to have the Accountability Act, the commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050. But if, unless we substantially ramp up where we are now, with 2030 being much deeper than where we are now, you can't get to 2050 in carbon neutrality. So th these things all work together to say, when we have a chance to look post pandemic <laughs> at how we stimulate our economy, Where's the resilience? Where's the recovery? How do we do it? We're going to have to do it through the lens of climate action in order to ensure that we don't have a much worse public health outcome because we ignored the climate change crisis. And, and that's, a, I think, a, a useful place to, to say, what do those policies look like going forward? Because when I think of climate policies, I think of them through the lens of ambition, so our targets accountability and making sure that there's a five-year carbon budget place to turn those long-term targets into short-term practical action. But then it comes down to that stronger climate action too. So ambition, accountability, and action. And when we talk about action, so we are looking, I think, energy efficiency measures are going to be more difficult because the price of oil has bottomed out. Uh, that's what the, the executive director of the IEA says, at least. And so we're looking at hopefully major public investments in clean technologies, major public investments in the infrastructure, whether it's electric vehicle infrastructure or other infrastructure necessary for the clean economy. And, and then I, we were both on a, a, an interesting town hall hosted by Lead Now and others where if, hey, if they can get 700 people onto a Zoom town hall and it functions, we should have parliament meeting remotely as well without yeah. too, too much difficulty. But it was really interesting. The focus there was on support workers in the oil and gas sector not to support oil and gas executives and to support the companies in unsustainable business models, but to support the workers transition. And, and I got feedback on Twitter from, you know, you mentioned uh, trolls, but there was one organization, I forget the name of it, but they sort of said, you were at this rally and you don't support workers. And, and again, their language was about workers. And it, it did strike me that isn't that the place to come together and say, yeah. we can't prop up an industry there's a place for oil in 2050 to some extent, but certainly not to the extent that we see it today. So this is going to have to be an industry that, that changes yeah. and, and, and we need the workers to, to, be, to be moving into a different place. And so do you see that as the, as the critical focus to maybe take some of the difficulties out of the politics? 
I hope so. The support for the Just Transition Plan that um, there was, you know, the task force that Kath McKenna put together that looked only at the coal sector workers, that did a, a, an enormous amount of good, solid work that put in place principles for how we support workers and communities. And we have to remember, this isn't the first time Canada's done this. We forget that Quebec shut down the asbestos industry. There were people in that industry who thought it was a good industry. And we had to say, sorry, the science is telling us that we're killing 100,000 people around the world with asbestos-related occupational exposure. We can't be a country that exports asbestos. It's just, it's over. Uh, we can't be a country that relies on fossil fuels. We can get bitumen out of the ground and potentially use it as a feedstock for petrochemical products. Right. There's things we, can, but, but we need to look at, look, the price of solar panels. Uh, in Alberta, the best potential anywhere in Canada for solar. We need to think of our buildings not just as energy efficient, but as, as carbon negative, that the buildings we're in produce more energy than they need uh, in, you know, in terms of buildings, heating and cooling. Buildings can actually, with solar panels on the roofs and heat pumps and energy efficiency and adequate insulation, we can produce more energy than we're using in our buildings. There's things we can do that are beyond current limitations on thinking that every policy we come up with is designed based on what we see in the rear view mirror instead of what's out ahead. And I think we're at the point of really solid transition. So my last question for you is a more personal one. You are now not the Green Party leader, as I understand it, but the parliamentary Green Party leader. Yeah. Uh, although I, I don't think any Canadian would, would think of you as anyone other than the leader of the Green Party still. What do you, what's, what's next? I mean, are, will you run in the next election? Oh will gosh, you... yes. I love being in parliament. Uh, I do feel it's, back to your earlier point, being a parliamentarian where people are listening and I think a minority parliament gives us real opportunities. And again, in the next election, I will run to be the member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands. I want to support the next leader of the Green Party and keep building our caucus. We really, as you know, first past the post makes it tough for us. We got a million votes across, one over a million. We got close to the same number of votes as the Bloc Québécois. They get 32 seats and we get three. We were 100,000 votes apart with over 1.1 million for us, 1.2 million for them. That's the first past the post system. So even with that system, we have to you know, prove ourselves enough to build to a caucus of 12. Uh, so my idea is succession planning. I'm not leaving the, the, I'm hoping I'm not leaving parliament. That's up to the voters of Saanich Gulf Islands. But I want to continue to build our Green Caucus and our approach, which is focus on the science, all hands on deck, and working with lovely people like you from across the aisle who actually get the point. I hope to continue working with you, and, and thanks for joining me. And I forgot to acknowledge I'm speaking to you from the Coast Salish territory of what uh, was Sanic Nation. So, Heishka Siam, I raise my hands to you. Bye bye. Thanks, Liz. That's Elizabeth May on this episode of Uncommons. Thanks for joining us, and remember to subscribe at uncommons.ca for future episodes, including Hetty Fry and Peter Singer.